Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family. Marks, Peggy, William, Lester, Jessica, and Rochelle. Thank you all so much for becoming supporters of this podcast. By joining Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you're interested in supporting us and finding out more about the perks available to subscribers, including monthly episodes heard nowhere else, you'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. You'll also find a link to buymeacoffee.com, where you can support us with a one-time tip, no subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight, we're relaxing with a work suggested by one of your fellow listeners and another Patreon supporter, Lisa B. We're reading Wildflowers Worth Knowing, adapted by Aza Don Dickinson, from Nature's Garden by Nelchi Blanken, first published in 1917. Let's begin. Preface A still more popular edition of what has proved to the author to be a surprisingly popular book has been prepared by the able hand of Mr. Aza Don Dickinson and is now offered in the hope that many more people will find the wildflowers in nature's garden all about us well worth knowing. For flowers have distinct objects in life, and are everything they are for the most justifiable of reasons, i.e. the perpetuation and the improvement of their species. The means they employ to accomplish these ends are so various, and so consummately clever, that in learning to understand them, we are brought to realize how similar they are to the fundamental aims of even the human race. Indeed, there are few life principles that plants have not worked out satisfactorily. The problems of adapting oneself to one's environment, of ensuring healthy families, of starting one's children well in life, of founding new colonies in distant lands, of the cooperative method of conducting business as opposed to the individualistic, of laying up treasure in the bank for future use, of punishing vice and rewarding virtue. These and many other problems of mankind, the flowers have worked out with the help of insects through the ages. To really understand what the wildflowers are doing, what the scheme of each one is, besides looking beautiful, is to give one a broader sympathy with both man and nature, and to add a real interest and joy to life, which cannot be too widely shared. Nelchi Blanken Oyster Bay, New York, January 2nd, 1917. Editor's Note The nomenclature and classification of Gray's new Manual of Botany, as rearranged and revised by Professors Robinson and Fernald, have been followed throughout the book. 
This system is based upon that of Eichler, as developed by Engler and Prentel. A variant form of name is also sometimes given to assist in identification. Aza Don Dickinson Wildflowers Worth Knowing Water Plantain Family Alice Maciej The Broad-Leaved Arrowhead Sagittaria Latifolia or Sagittaria Variabilis Flowers 1 to 1 and 1 half inches wide in three bracked whorls of three born near the summit of a leafless scape, four inches to four feet tall. Calyx of three sepals, corolla of three rounded spreading petals. Stamens and pistils numerous, the former yellow in upper flowers, usually absent or imperfect in lower pistillate flowers. Leaves exceedingly variable, those underwater usually long and grass-like, upper one sharply arrow-shaped or blunt and broad, spongy or leathery on long petioles. Preferred habitat, shallow water and mud. Flowering season, July to September. Distribution, from Mexico northward throughout our area to the circumpolar regions. Wading into shallow water or standing on some muddy shore like a heron. This striking plant, so often found in that bird's haunts, is quite as decorative in a picture and happily far more approachable in life. Indeed, one of the comforts of botany, as compared with bird study, is that we may get close enough to the flowers to observe their last detail, whereas the bird we have followed laboriously over hill and dale, through briars and swamps, darts away beyond the range of field glasses with tantalizing swiftness. While no single plant is yet thoroughly known to scientists, in spite of the years of study devoted by specialists to separate groups, no plant remains wholly meaningless. When Kepler discovered the majestic order of movement of the heavenly bodies, he exclaimed, O oh God, I think thy thoughts after thee. The expression of a discipleship every reverent soul must be conscious of in penetrating be it ever so little away, into the inner meaning of the humblest wayside weed. Any plant which elects to grow in shallow water must be amphibious. It must be able to breathe beneath the surface as the fish do, and also be adapted to thrive without those parts that correspond to gills. For ponds and streams have an unpleasant way of drying up in summer, leaving it stranded on the shore. This accounts in part for the variable leaves on the arrowhead, those underneath the water being long and ribbon-like to bring the greatest possible area into contact with the air with which the water is charged. Broad leaves would be torn to shreds by the current, through which grass-like blades glide harmlessly. But when this plant grows on shore, having no longer use for its lower ribbons, it loses them and expands only broad, arrow-shaped surfaces to the sunny air. Leaves to be supplied with carbonic acid to assimilate and sunshine to turn off the oxygen and store up the carbon into their system. Aram family, Aracea, the jack in the pulpit, or Indian turnip, Aracema trifilum, 
flowers, minute greenish-yellow, clustered on the lower part of a smooth, club-shaped slender spadix. Within a green and maroon or whitish striped spath that curves in a broad pointed flap above it. Leaves three foliate, usually overtopping the spath, their splendor petioles nine to thirty inches high, or as tall as the scape that rises from an acrid corm. Fruit smooth, shining red berries clustered on the thickened club. Preferred habitat, moist woodland and thickets. Flowering season, April to June. Distribution, Nova Scotia westward to Minnesota and southward to the Gulf States. A jolly looking preacher is Jack, standing erect in his party colored pulpit with a sounding board over his head. But he is a gay deceiver, a wolf in sheep's clothing, literally a brother to dragons, an errant upstart, an ingrate, a murderer of innocent benefactors. Female botanizing classes pounce upon it as they would upon a pious young clergyman complains Mr. Elwanger. A poor relation of the stately calla lily, one knows Jack to be at a glance, her lovely white robe corresponding to his striped pulpit, her bright yellow spadix to his sleek reverence. In the damp woodlands where his pulpit is erected beneath leafy cathedral arches, Minute flies or gnats, recently emerged from maggots in mushrooms, toadstools, or decaying logs, form the main part of his congregation. Now, to drop the clerical simile, let us peep within the sheathing spath, or better still, strip it off altogether. Dr. Tory states that the dark striped spaz are the fertile plants, those with green and whitish lines sterile. Within are smooth, glossy columns, and near the base of each we shall find the true flowers, minute affairs, some staminate, others on distinct plants pistillate, the berry bearers or rarely both male and female florets seated on the same club. As if Jack's elaborate plan to prevent self-fertilization were not yet complete. Plants may be detected in process of evolution toward their ideals, just as nations and men are. Doubtless when Jack's mechanism is perfected, his guilt will disappear. A little way above the florets, the club enlarges abruptly, forming a projecting ledge that effectually closes the avenue of escape for many a guileless victim. A fungus gnat, enticed perhaps by the striped house of refuge from cold spring winds and with a prospect of food below, enters and slides down the inside walls or the slippery colored column. In either case, descent is very easy. It is the return that is made so difficult, if not impossible, for the tiny visitors. Squeezing past the projecting ledge, the gnat finds himself in a roomy apartment, whose floor the bottom of the pulpit is dusted over with fine pollen, that is, if he is among staminate flowers already mature. To get some of that pollen, with which the gnat presently covers himself, transferred to the minute pistillate florets, waiting for it in a distant chamber, 
is, of course, Jack's whole aim in enticing visitors within his polished walls. But what means are provided for their escape? Their efforts to crawl upward over the slippery surface only land them weak and discouraged where they started. The projecting ledge overhead prevents them from using their wings. The passage between the ledge and the spath is far too narrow to permit flight. Now, if a gnat be persevering, he will presently discover a gap in the flap where the spath folds together in front, and through this tiny opening he makes his escape, only to enter another pulpit, like the trusted but too trusting messenger he is, and leaves some of the vitalizing pollen on the fertile florets awaiting his coming. But suppose the fly, small as he is, is too large to work his way out through the flap, or too bewildered or stupid to find the opening, or too exhausted after his futile efforts to get out through the overhead route to persevere, or too weak with hunger in case of long detention in a pistolet trap where no pollen is. What then? Open a dozen of Jack's pulpits, and in several at least, dead victims will be found. Pathetic little corpses, sacrificed to the imperfection of his executive system. Had the flies entered mature spaths, whose walls had spread outward and away from the polished column, flight through the overhead route might have been possible. However glad we may be to make every due allowance for this sacrifice of the higher life to the lower as only a temporary imperfection of mechanism incidental to the plant's higher development, Jack's present cruelty shocks us no less. Or it may be he will become insectivorous like the pitcher plant in time. He comes from a rascally family anyhow. His cousin, the Cuckoo Pint, as is well known, destroys the winged messenger bearing its offspring to plant fresh colonies in a distant bog, because the decayed body of the bird acts as the best possible fertilizer into which the seedling may strike its roots. In June and July, the thick-set club, studded over with bright berries, becomes conspicuous to attract hungry woodland rovers in the hope that the seeds will be dropped far from the parent plant. The Indians used to boil the berries for food. The farinaceous root, or corm, they likewise boiled or dried to extract the stinging, blistering juice, leaving an edible little turnip, however insipid and starchy. Skunk or Swamp Cabbage Simplicarpus fetidus Flowers Minute, perfect, fetid Many scattered over a thick, rounded, fleshy spadix and hidden within a swollen, shell-shaped, purplish-brown to greenish-yellow, usually mottled spath, close to the ground that appears before the leaves. Spadix much enlarged and spongy in fruit, the bulb-like berries embedded in its surface. Leaves, in large crowns like cabbages, broadly ovate, often one foot across, strongly nerved, their petioles with deep grooves, malodorous. Preferred habitat, swamps and wet ground. Flowering season, February to April. Distribution, 
Nova Scotia to Florida, and westward to Minnesota and Iowa. This despised relative of the stately Kala Lily proclaimed spring in the very teeth of winter, being the first bold adventurer above ground. When the lovely Hepatica, the first flower worthy the name to appear, is still wrapped in her fuzzy furs, the skunk cabbage's dark incurved horn shelters within its hollow tiny malodorous florets. Why is the entire plant so fetid that one flees the neighborhood, pervaded as it is with an odor that combines a suspicion of skunk, putrid meat, and garlic? After investigating the carrion flower and the purple trillium, among others, we learned that certain flies delight in foul odors loathsome to higher organisms. That plants dependent on these pollen carriers woo them from long distances with a stench, and in addition, sometimes try to charm them with color resembling the sort of meat it is their special mission, with the help of beetles and other scavengers of nature, to remove from the face of the earth. In such marshy ground as the skunk cabbage lives in, many small flies and gnats live in embryo under the fallen leaves during the winter. But even before they are warmed into active life, the hive bees, natives of Europe, and with habits not perfectly adapted as yet to our flora, are out after pollen. After the flowering time come the vivid green crowns of leaves that at least please the eye. Lizards make their home beneath them, and many a yellow throat, taking advantage of the plant's foul odor, gladly puts up with it herself and builds her nest in the hollow of the cabbage as a protection for her eggs and young from four-footed enemies. Cattle let the plant alone because of the stinging, acrid juices secreted by it, although such tender, fresh, bright foliage must be especially tempting, like the hellebores after a dry winter diet. Sometimes tiny insects are found, drowned in the wells of rainwater, that accumulate at the base of the grooved leaf stalks. Spiderwort family, Comolinacea, the Virginia or common day flower, Comolina virginica. Flowers blue, one inch broad or less, irregular, grouped at end of stem and upheld by long, leaf-like bracts. Calyx of three unequal sepals, three petals, one inconspicuous, two showy, rounded. Perfect stamens, three, the anther of one incurved stamen largest, three insignificant and sterile stamens, one pistil, Stem, fleshy, smooth, branched, mucilaginous. Leaves, lance-shaped, three to five inches long, sheathing the stem at base. Upper leaves in a spath-like bract, folding like a hood about flowers. Fruit, a three-celled capsule, one seed in each cell. Preferred habitat, moist, shady ground. Flowering season, June to September. Distribution, southern New York to Illinois and Michigan, Nebraska, Texas, and through tropical America to Paraguay.
Delightful Linnaeus, who dearly loved his little joke, himself confesses to have named the day flowers after three brothers Kamelin, Dutch botanists, because two of them, commemorated in the two showy blue petals of the blossom, published their works. The third, lacking application and ambition, amounted to nothing, like the inconspicuous whitish third petal. Happily, Caspar Comelin died in 1731, before the joke was perpetrated in Species Plantarum. Soon after noon, the day flower's petals roll up, never to open again. Pickerelweed Family Pontideriaceae The Pickerelweed Pontideria cordata Flowers Bright purplish blue, including filaments, anthers, and style, crowded in a dense spike, quickly fading, unpleasantly odorous. Perianth tubular, two lipped, parted into six irregular lobes, free from ovary. Middle lobe of upper lip with two yellow spots at base within. Stamen six, placed at unequal distances on tube, three opposite each lip. Pistil one, the stigma minutely toothed. Stem, erect, stout, fleshy, one to four feet tall, not often over two feet above the waterline. Leaves, several bract-like, sheathing stem at base. One leaf only, midway on flower stalk. Thick, polished, triangular, or arrow-shaped. Four to eight inches long, two to six inches across base. Preferred habitat, shallow water of ponds and streams. Flowering season, June to October. Distribution, eastern half of United States and Canada. Grace of habit and the bright beauty of its long blue spikes of ragged flowers above rich glossy leaves give a charm to this vigorous wader. Backwoodsmen will tell you that pickerels lay their eggs among the leaves, but so they do among the sedges, arums, wild rice, and various aquatic plants, like many another fish. Bees and flies that congregate about the blossoms to feed may sometimes fly too low, and so give a plausible reason for the pickerel's choice of haunt. Each blossom lasts but a single day, the upper portion withering, leaves the base of the perianth to harden about the ovary and protect the solitary seed. But as the gradually lengthened spike keeps up an uninterrupted succession of bloom for months, more than ample provision is made for the perpetuation of the race a necessity to any plant that refuses to thrive unless it stands in water. Ponds and streams have an unpleasant habit of drying up in summer, and often the pickerel weed looks as brown as a bulrush, where it is stranded in the baked mud in August. When seed falls on such ground, if indeed it germinates at all, the young plant naturally withers away. Of the three kinds of blossoms, one raises its stigma on a long style reaching to the top of the flower. A second form reaches its stigma only halfway up, and the third keeps its stigma in the bottom of the tube. The visiting bee gets his abdomen 
his chest and his tongue dusted with pollen from long, middle length and short stamens respectively. When he visits another flower, these parts of his body coming in contact with the stigmas that occupy precisely the position where the stamens were in other individuals. He brushes off each lot of pollen just where it will do the most good. Lily Family Liliacea The American White Hellebore or Indian Poke or Itchweed Veratrum Viridae Flowers, dingy, pale yellowish or whitish green, growing greener with age, one inch or less across. Very numerous, in stiff branching, spike-like, dense flowered panicles. Perianth of six oblong segments, six short curved stamens, three styles. Stem, stout, leafy, two to eight feet tall. Leaves, plated, lower ones broadly oval, pointed, six to twelve inches long. Parallel ribbed, sheathing the stem where they clasp it. Upper leaves gradually narrowing, those among flowers small. Preferred habitat, swamps, wet woods, low meadows. Flowering season, May to July. Distribution, British possessions from ocean to ocean, southward in the United States to Georgia, Tennessee, and Minnesota. Borage and hellebore fill two scenes, sovereign plants to purge the veins of melancholy and cheer the heart of those black fumes which make it smart. Such are the antidotes for madness prescribed by Burton in his Anatomy of Melancholy. But like most medicines, so the homeopaths have taught us, the plant that heals may also poison, and the coarse, thick rootstock of this hellebore sometimes does deadly work. The shining plated leaves, put forth so early in the spring, they are especially tempting to grazing cattle on that account, are too well known by most animals, however, to be touched by them. Precisely the end desired, of course, by the hellebore, nightshade, aconite, cyclamen, Jamestown weed, and a host of others that resort for protection to the low trick of mixing poisonous chemicals with their cellular juices. Pliny told how the horses, oxen, and swine of his day were killed by eating the foliage of the black hellebore. But the flies which cross-fertilize this plant seem to be uninjured by its nectar. Wild yellow, meadow or field lily, or Canada lily, Lilium canadense. Flowers yellow to orange-red, of a deeper shade within, and speckled with dark reddish-brown dots. One or several, rarely many, nodding on long pedicles from the summit. Perianth bell-shaped, of six spreading segments two to three inches long, their tips curved backward to the middle. Six stamens with reddish-brown linear anthers. One pistil, club-shaped. The stigma, three-lobed. Stem, two to five feet tall, leafy, from a bulbous rootstock composed of numerous fleshy white scales. 
leaves, lance-shaped to oblong, usually in whorls of fours to tens or some alternate. Fruit, an erect, oblong, three-celled capsule, the flat, horizontal seeds packed in two rows in each cavity. Preferred habitat, swamps, low meadows, moist fields. Flowering season, June to July. Distribution, Nova Scotia to Georgia, westward beyond the Mississippi. Not our gorgeous lilies that brighten the low-lying meadows in early summer with pendant swaying bells. Possibly not a true lily at all was chosen to illustrate the truth which those who listened to the Sermon on the Mount and we, equally anxious, foolishly overburdened folk of today, so little comprehend. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Opinions differ as to the lily of scripture. Eastern peoples use the same word interchangeably for the tulip, anemone, ranunculus, iris, the water lilies, and those of the field. The superb scarlet martigan lily, Lilium chalcedonicum, grown in gardens here, is not uncommon wild in Palestine. But whoever has seen the large anemones there, carpeting every plain and luxuriantly pervading the land, is inclined to believe that Jesus, who always chose the most familiar objects in the daily life of his simple listeners to illustrate his teachings, rested his eyes on the slopes about him, glowing with anemones in all their matchless loveliness. What flower served him then matters not at all. It is enough that scientists, now more plainly than ever before, see the universal application of the illustration the more deeply they study nature, and can include their little brothers of the air and the humblest flower at their feet when they say with Paul, in God we live and move and have our being. Tallest and most prolific of bloom among our native lilies, as it is the most variable in color, size, and form, the Turk's cap or turban lily, Lilium superbum, sometimes nearly merges its identity into its Canadian sisters. Travelers by rail between New York and Boston know how gorgeous are the low meadows and marshes in July or August when its clusters of deep yellow, orange, or flame-colored lilies tower above the surrounding vegetation. Like the color of most flowers, theirs intensifies in salt air. Commonly, from three to seven lilies appear in a terminal group. But under skillful cultivation, even forty will crown the stalk that reaches a height of nine feet where its home suits it perfectly. Or maybe only a poor array of dingy yellowish caps top a shriveled stem when unfavorable conditions prevail there certainly are times when its specific name seems extravagant. Red, Wood, Flame, or Philadelphia Lily Lilium Philadelphicum Flowers, erect, tawny, or red-tinted outside, 
vermilion, or sometimes reddish-orange, and spotted with matter brown within, one to five on separate pedicles born at the summit, perianth of six distinct, spreading, spatulate segments, each narrowed into a claw and with a nectar groove at its base, six stamens, one style, the club-shaped stigma three-lobed, stem one to three feet tall, from a bulb composed of narrow, jointed, fleshy scales, leaves in whorls of threes to eights, lance-shaped, seated at intervals on the stem. Preferred habitat, dry woods, sandy soil, borders, and thickets. Flowering season, June to July. Distribution, northern border of United States, westward to Ontario, south to the Carolinas and West Virginia. Erect, as if conscious of its striking beauty, this vivid lily lifts a chalice that suggests a trap for catching sunbeams from fiery old Saul. Defiant of his scorching rays in its dry habitat, it neither nods nor droops, even during prolonged drought. And yet many people confuse it with the gracefully pendant swaying bells of the yellow Canada lily, which will grow in a swamp rather than forgo moisture. La, the Celtic for white, from which the family derived its name, makes this bright-hued flower blush to own it. Seedsmen who export quantities of our superb native lilies to Europe supply bulbs so cheap that no one should wait four years for flowers from seed or go without their splendor in our over-conventional gardens. Yellow Adder's Tongue, Trout Lily, or Dog-Toothed Violet Erythronium Americanum Flower, solitary, pale russet yellow, rarely tinged with purple, slightly fragrant, one to two inches long, nodding from the summit of a root stalk, six to twelve inches high, or about as tall as the leaves. Perianth bell-shaped, of six petal-like distinct segments, spreading at tips, dark-spotted within. Six stamens, the club-shaped style with three short stigmatic ridges. Leaves, two, unequal, grayish-green, mottled and streaked with brown or all-green, oblong, three to eight inches long, narrowing into clasping petioles. Preferred habitat, moist open woods and thickets and brooksides. Flowering season, March to May. Distribution, Nova Scotia to Florida, westward to the Mississippi. Colonies of these dainty little lilies that so often grow beside leaping brooks, where and when the trout hide, justify at least one of their names. But they have nothing in common with the violet or a dog's tooth. Their faint fragrance rather suggests a tulip. And as for the bulb, which in some of the lily kin has tooth-like scales, it is, in this case, a smooth egg-shaped corm, producing little round offsets from its base. Much fault is also found with another name, on the plea that the curiously mottled 
and delicately penciled leaves bring to mind not a snake's tongue, but its skin, as they surely do. Whoever sees the sharp, purplish point of a young plant darting above ground in earliest spring, however, at once sees the fitting application of adder's tongue. But how few recognize their plant friends at all seasons of the year. Everyone must have noticed the abundance of low-growing spring flowers in deciduous woodlands, where later in the year, after the leaves overhead cast a heavy shade, so few blossoms are to be found because their light is seriously diminished. The thrifty adder's tongue, by laying up nourishment in its storeroom underground through the winter, is ready to send its leaves and flower upward to take advantage of the sunlight the still naked trees do not intercept, just as soon as the ground thaws. Yellow Clintonia Clintonia Borealis Flowers, straw color or greenish yellow, less than one inch long, three to six nodding or slender pedicles from the summit of a leafless scape, six to fifteen inches tall, perianth of six spreading divisions, the six stamens attached, style three-lobed, leaves, dark, glossy, large, oval to oblong, two to five, usually three, sheathing at the base. Fruit, oval blue berries on upright pedicels. Preferred habitat, moist, rich, cool woods and thickets. Flowering season, May to June. Distribution, from the Carolinas and Wisconsin far northward. To name canals, bridges, city thoroughfares, booming factory towns after DeWitt Clinton seems to many appropriate enough. But why a shy little woodland flower? As fitly might a wee white violet carry down the name of Theodore Roosevelt to posterity. Gray should not have named the flower from the governor of New York, complains Thoreau. What is he to the lovers of flowers in Massachusetts? If named after a man, it must be a man of flowers. So completely has Clinton, the practical man of affairs, obliterated Clinton the naturalist from the popular mind, that were it not for this plant keeping his memory green, we should be in danger of forgetting the weary, overworked governor, fleeing from care to the woods and fields, pursuing in the open air the study which above all others delighted and refreshed him revealing in every leisure moment a too often forgotten side of his many-sided greatness. And with that, I think we'll end this evening's reading from Wild Flowers Worth Knowing. We're still in the middle of the Lily family, and there are 400 more pages to go. So beautiful and varied is the botanical world. I hope you enjoyed that. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, just like listener Lisa did, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod or drop me an email via our website, 
www.boringbookspod.com. I always love hearing from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night. <laughs>